Next on call, go inside a sleep lab. We try to make it as comfortable and home-like as possible. And learn about getting a healthy night's rest. There's a few things. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Welcome to On Call. I'm Tammy Watson. Insomnia, sleep apnea, narcolepsy, you probably know the names of some sleep disorders and tonight we're going to talk about these and other health problems that stand in the way of you and a good night's rest. And we're going to talk about how sleep disorders can sometimes be related to serious health problems like heart disease, strokes, and high blood pressure. Here with me in the studio are Dr. Anthony Herricks and the on -call medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm, and they're ready to answer your questions about sleep disorders right now. You can call into our toll-free number. It's 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. Again, that phone number is 1-888-376-6225 for questions about sleep disorders. And helping answer the, phones, answer the phones tonight and take your questions are volunteers from the Brookings Health System. Dr. Holm, let's dive right in. What are some of the health problems, other than fatigue, that can be related to constantly getting poor sleep? Well, if you take sleep apnea, they get hypoxia through the night. I mean, they don't get enough yeah, oxygen. Problem with breathing, and, and then... And you... their oxygen level drops, and, uh, and when you starve the cells from oxygen, you end up with all sorts of trouble including heart failure and heart attacks and vascular disease and premature aging. I mean all of the all of the major things that are very very bad hypertension and psychiatric problems. I mean uh, the the complication of sleep apnea is certainly a very important thing to understand. And then who knows what the complications of not getting an, just enough sleep, uh, proper sleep and uh, and using the sleeplessness as a clue to other problems, mm. uh, as the big clue, depression. So, I mean, we've got a lot to talk about. There's, there's a lot about sleep out there. We really want your calls. I'm pleased to introduce to you our guest for this evening, Dr. Anthony Herricks. Dr. Herricks practices at Avera Medical Group, Pulmonary and Sleep Medicine in Sioux Falls. Tony, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting so, me. So now you're from, uh, uh, are you a South Dakota boy? Yes, I grew up in Gettysburg, South Dakota. Gettysburg, were you a town kid or a ranch kid? We lived about five miles out in the country, but we only had a couple of horses, a couple of cows, had some buffalo and a few chickens at a oh, for yeah. a while. But then <laughs> when I was probably a sophomore in high school, we ultimately moved into town and that's you where became we became a townie. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then you, you uh, the, the word is you married a girl from Brookings. Is that, that the is correct? So we, we're, we're almost related. Yes, we are. <laughs> there we go. In South Dakota, so, yeah. But what is your training? What kind of a doctor are you? I'm a pulmonary physician who is studying to be board certified in sleep medicine. We also do critical care medicine in my practice and managing both inpatient, outpatient pulmonary disease, sleep medicine, and uh, obviously the critically ill patients. Well, now, critically ill a critical Ill, Ill specialist. Tell me a little bit more about what that is. Well, when uh, people become very ill and they no longer need just the regular part of the hospital, they need to go to the ICU for special monitoring, either of their blood pressure, special, special medications that can't be given on the regular floor, you need a ventilator, respiratory devices, things to support the heart. We help uh, manage those patients. In and the you do, you, you coordinate the EICU? 
We help with the ICU uh, right now based on the way that Avera is set up. They have a subgroup of EICU physicians that cover. Um, we have the ability as pulmonologists and intensivists to uh, help in the EICU, but uh, we have a, a mixed group of non-pulmonary intensivists and pulmonary intensivists that cover the ICU right now about 16 hours a day. And pulmonary means lung. lung I mean, yes, lung. lung sorry, so yeah. all things lung. Yep. And if you talk about sleep, and one more quick word be before we take the break. So uh, a big part of what you do has to do with sleep? Yes, um, there is sleep medicine is growing with leaps and bounds. And ad, as of this time, there are so many patients that come into clinic for sleep-related disorders or, excuse me, pulmonary-related disorders, cough, shortness of breath, that they have a lot of overlap with sleep apnea and other conditions that are associated with it. So, okay. Well, we, we should explore these, and we'd love to explore them if we've got your questions. So. We'll take those calls after this. Narcolepsy is a sleep disorder that causes excessive sleepiness and frequent daytime sleep attacks. Before we really begin our discussion tonight, we're going to bring you an interview that covers the basics of sleep medicine. Earlier this summer, On Call spoke with Dr. Annette Bosworth about some of the things that come up when a patient talks to a physician about fatigue and lack of sleep. Here's what she had to say. Dr. Bosworth, I want to ask you about sleep and fatigue. These are issues that you talk to people about. Right, all the time. Um, a very common reason that uh, people come to see a physician is, doctor, doctor, I'm so tired. Can you help figure out why I'm so tired? And um, although most physicians will start with a few labs uh, that can be known for making people tired, uh, where the money usually ends up in our society is at the sleep times. Um, we are a society that likes a fast pace and we have lived a life that continues to keep going long after sundown. What happens if we don't get enough sleep? Does the body actually kind of runs down and runs out of steam? Yeah, there's actually more things that uh, happen when your body's not getting good rest than just fatigue. Fatigue is a, is a symptom. Your body's telling you, I need to recover, I need to rest and that happens when you get predictable good sleep. But other things that happen along with chronically sleep deprived people is that their, their minds are not as sharp, they'll have memory troubles. Uh, short term memory is one of them, but also word finding is associated with lack of sleep. Uh, you'll find that mood is very related to uh, the, the sleep uh, stability and how often we get our solid recovery of sleep. Um, there's several uh, uh, brain, uh, I call them hormones, they're really not hormones, but there's several parts of the chemistries of the brain activity that become less and less and less robust and resilient the longer days we go without a good night's sleep. Um, you'll find immune systems are not uh, as hardy. You can uh, look at the recovery of a white blood cell and how well it attacks an, in, an infection, and it does have a correlation to how well that patient's been sleeping. If a patient comes to you and between the discussion of the two of you, you figure out that the patient is not getting adequate sleep. What are the first two or three things you're going to tell them about how to improve or take care of that situation? I say there's a few things that help clean up what we call the sleep hygiene, the rules of getting good sleep. One of them is get the television out of the bedroom. Electronics do not belong in the bedroom for the main reason is that the light from them is so stimulating to our brains that it takes several hours for the brain to truly shut down after seeing those bright lights. So televisions in the bedroom are a big enemy if you're not getting good sleep. The other part is being respectful of the time. Being Brains like a schedule, they like a predictable uh, uh, shutdown time which will then eventually turn into a predictable awakening time. and. Uh, in our society, that's, it can be difficult to do, especially if you have young kids. Uh, you can have schedules that change frequently, but a stable bedtime is very helpful for fixing a lot of the sleep problems. The other part that I have them try to not do is any activities in bed. Um, even if they want to read before bed, it's a fantastic way to kind of shut down the mind or journal before bed. Those are really great meditation forms, essentially, to shut down the brain, but don't do it in bed. Do it in the chair next to the bed, but don't do it in bed. So those are some of the easy ones. Thank you, Dr. Bosworth. Doctors, let's follow up and talk a little bit more about the basics of sleep hygiene and why sleep is important to the body. I was going to make a comment about 
sleeping pills and, uh, has been the trend through the years about uh, the cure for sleeping problems, and they forget the other things that uh, Annette was talking about. What's your response to that? The very first thing that I mention to my patients when they walk into the room is sleep hygiene. If you think about insomnia and all the other sleep disorders, what ends up happening is you get this problem that it intrudes into your sleep and makes you tired, and then that disorganizes the rest of your day. And pretty soon you have this behavior that is inconducive with any kind of sleep pattern that you would like to have. And the problem is, is if you walked into your house and it was disorganized, or you walked into your office, or your day wasn't got messed up for something, you become very stressed and, and life just is, doesn't flow. And that's yeah. the same thing that happens with sleep. So, uh, you know, how do you help it? You try to clean up your hygiene. You clean up your room. You right. Know, right. The ideas of a cooler room, get the TV out of the room. Right. I jokingly tell all my patients there's two things that should go on in the bedroom. One is marital relations and the other is sleep. Everything no else that... No TV, no radio? No, no TV, no radio, no computers, no books, no crossword puzzles because the bedroom is meant for sleep. And once you take and put something into the bedroom that subtracts from that, then that now subtracts from the reason you're there and it gives you another reason to be in bed. Oh, that's hard to swallow, take I, that, that piece of advice, really. I, how can you convince me to... <laughs> that, no, I've, yeah, that's like hard how, to convince. Yeah. I, 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 a million people have their TV in their bedroom. Uh, we do not, but we do have books. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's our ritual, going to bed and then having a half an hour or 45 minutes or 15 minutes or some, some days, three minutes before you fall asleep trying to read the book and you know, okay, now I'm ready, boom, gone, and uh, uh, it helps me. But you're arguing that people are saying no books. I, I, I think that, well, as I said, nothing but sleep because give me, I'll give you an example. Patients will go to their bedroom, they'll get on their laptop, they'll play a game. They, they say that they turn the TV on because the noise helps them go to sleep or they'll get, grab that book to read. But anything other than relaxation and the ability to go to sleep actually will subtract from your ability to go to sleep. If you find that good book or you get into that good chapter and you say, well, I'm just going to need to read another page or I'm just going to need another yeah. chapter, pretty soon as 10 or 15 minutes have gone by and you're not sleeping. The normal sleep latency for most adults in general should be less than 30 minutes. And so if you can imagine how... In sleep latency, that's how long it takes Yeah, how long it takes asleep. from the time you lay down to close your eyes till you actually go to sleep. But some people lay there and they go, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, and then and the volume accelerates. And the more anxiety they get because they can't sleep, they can't sleep, and they want to go right away. So um, I have suggested in those cases a sleep hypnosis kind of a program right. of relaxation of sequential parts of your body and breathing out and letting go of all things. Only allow one thing in your brain, like the word one or whatever, and then erase any other interfering thoughts, make it a make your brain a, 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 a whiteboard or a blackboard and erase any th other ideas that come up. Anything else that you would suggest? Sleep hygiene essentially go to bed at the same time every night, get up at the same time every day. Go to bed, shut off the lights, get comfortable, warm, cool, whatever you like it. The clock watchers are horrible. I tell people to set their alarms, turn the clock away from you so you have no clue what time it is. A lot of the major sleep treatments for insomnia have to do with cognitive behavioral therapy and biofeedback mechanisms, which are exactly what you're talking about. Erasing that mind and thinking of only something like that happy place. Tensing the muscles up so you feel the body when it's intense and then relax and watch it fall into the bed while concentrating on breathing or other ways to look into that. And then if you lay there for that 20 or 30 minutes and you're still not asleep, that's where I again tell them, Take that anxiety and that angst out of the bedroom. Bring it out into a very quiet pay place with a dim lit light. Find something boring to do. Don't vacuum. Don't do the dishes. Don't go to the garage. Don't grab the book. Don't turn on the TV. Something that's going to make you sleepy and when you're tired, go back to bed. Ultimately, what will end up happening is at some point you're going to be so tired that that sleep pressure is going to be there and you go to bed. But there again, you have to get up at the same time every morning. And then next night, that lack of sleep will cause more sleep pressure. Ultimately, that worry and angst will be taken out of the bedroom, and the bedroom will be a happy place for sleep. I mean, way more important than pills, don't you agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and the benzos, most of the, the sleeping pills that people prescribe are in that ben, the Valium group. Right. How do you feel about those pills? Medicines for insomnia or sleep in general are a band-aid in a way. And what, that, what I mean by that is they cover up the symptom of insomnia. 
if you look at the textbooks, most textbooks say that insomnia is actually a combination of problems. There's over 30 diagnostic abnormalities that contribute to insomnia. When you have that problem where you can't go to sleep and then you give a sleep aid, what you're doing is covering up the symptom. You're not actually diagnosing what the problem is. And the problem is actually what ultimately needs to be addressed because you stop the sleep aid. You still have the TV blaring in the bedroom. You're still not going to go to sleep. I would contend that the, the majority of time when people are unable to, uh, to sleep, it, it is related to depression or depression anxiety. And of course, uh, we have inappropriately treated anxiety with benzos in the past and sleeping pill kind of things. These are things that over time causes memory loss and, and it also induces depression, which is the cause of the problem in the first place. So you want to avoid those. I mean, I, I go, if I'm going to do a pill, it's going to be in the antidepressant group. Are those uh, ads that I see on TV for? Well, Lunesta and Ambien and, and uh, the old Dalmains and the Valiums, they're all benzodiazepines and they're all, you know, they're like two shots of Jack Daniels. I mean, they work on a short-term basis. I use them for people who are traveling, but it's not something you should be using on a long-term basis. I mean, do you agree with me? Yeah, most of the studies have been short term and the actual recommendations are to use them for less than a month. So the goal if you're going to use medications like that is actually to try to find out what the cause is. Use those medications to get over that anxiety, that depression, that fear of not getting any sleep and then try to fix the underlying problem and then once the underlying problem is resolved then people do better. And the only problem, but, but, however, the only trouble with those is that when you, <coughs> when you abruptly stop them, <coughs> we learned this about uh, Valium, people have withdrawal anxiety. Yes. And so then you're right back to where you were in the first place. So I, I, I tend to use, I mean, I use trazodone, which is in the antidepressant group for a lot of the nursing home patients, very, very low side effect profile, generic and, and cheap, and it's, and it's effective. I try not to use it, but if you need it for an elderly person particularly, um, it's safe. Well, and, and some would argue that most <coughs> of the reasons with some of those medications like the amitriptylines and the trazodones, and the benzodiazepines, they're not truly FDA, FDA approved for insomnia per se. And what they work through is the anticholinergic system, so like the Benadryls. So, so they make you... Talk down to me, what anticholinergic right. system? Right, it's like the Benadryl. When you take the Benadryl, you get that drowsy, groggy, sluggish feeling, and that's what makes you sleepy. And so it doesn't, it works on through that pathway. And it may not meet the best pathway to work on because there can be some hangover effects from it. There can be relate, uh, side effects related to dry mouth, what's called extra pyramidal side effects where you actually have some tongue rolling and movement disorders and things like that that contribute. And so they're not always necessarily the best drugs to use, even though they're probably the most popular drugs that are used. The other hand, you know, the benzodiazepines and the uh, benzodiazepine-like medications like the Lunestas and the Ambien's aren't the best answer either because they have their own, own problems. So. so so much of it gets back to the sleep hygiene that you're talking about. What, what if sleep hygiene doesn't... Do it. Yeah. You have to be patient. Sleep hygiene is not a works every, perfectly every night. I like the idea of sleep hygiene. I like to encourage exercise. I like the idea of, of uh, this uh, self-hypnosis relaxation technique. And, um, and I'll temporarily use something like trazodone, but not the benzos, because the benzos are so hard to stop. That's mm -hmm. the other problem with those. And you have to remember when you use medicines like the Ambien, the Lunestas, the benzos, that quitting them cold turkey and saying stop isn't the way to go because there's a lot of dependence issues that can occur with them. There's tolerance issues. And one of the one of the labels of insomnia is actually um, sleep aid or what do I want to call it? Um, there's the word finding problem from a physician. <laughs> yeah. But um, you get the uh, withdrawal side effects of dependence related to those medicines, and then you can't go to sleep. Okay. Well, the questions are starting to come in, so we'll dive into the first one. A caller from Sioux Falls, age 64, a gentleman. He says he's sleepy three-fourths of the day. He's been diagnosed with Parkinson's, and he also has restless leg and sleep apnea. He wears a CPAP, or BiPAC, CPAC mm -hmm. machine. Um, he takes Meripap, five milligrams, half pill a uh, day, qu clonazepine, correct me in my pronunciations, yeah. both at 8 p.m. Why is he so sleepy all the time? Is it the medicine or the Parkinson's or what? Well. My first shot at it is that the clonazepine might be long-acting and hanging in there. 
Uh, also, uh, what, what yeah, is that? that's mm -hmm. a benzo that is a long acting, and it's probably the one that's you know that psychiatrists use the most. Uh, <laughs> the uh, but you know he's got restless leg. That's a real problem, and sometimes you have to use something like clonazepam with restless leg. So I mean he's in he's on a Mirapex drug that is the right drug I think rather than others. I mean it's a complex story. He's got a lot of problems, and he's using CPAP. I where where do you would you go with that one, Tony? Well, I think you start with a good sleep history. You start with sleep logs because so much of well, I have this problem and this is what needs to be fixed. You have to get a very good history from him and to find out what time is his bedtime, what time he gets up in the morning. Number two is and it goes to the indications of a sleep study. Is I think a sleep study is important in just about anybody with sleep problems because it allows us to look at their architecture and say, is there anything intruding to the sleep? What might be meaning periodic leg movement disorder. 90% of people in theory, based on what I've read, with restless leg syndrome actually have periodic leg movement disorder, which means that once you go to sleep at night, all it takes is just a little twitch of the big toe, which may cause the brain to have an arousal or an awakening. And if the brain has frequent arousals and awakenings, then it doesn't feel rested and you don't feel rested. And we know the same works with sleep apnea if the brain gets woken up frequently, that ultimately what happens is you don't feel sleep. And once you reverse that problem, you start feeling more rested. There's a lot about, uh, and I've talked with Annette about this uh, before, Bosworth, who was a guest earlier. She senses that a lot of problems, particularly fibromyalgia, might well be a, co a, a consequence of poor sleep. Well, uh, do you want to talk and explain a little bit about what's actually going on in the brain and the stages of sleep? Well, talk about them. Uh, what are the stages of sleep? Well, first is one which we all don't think about, which is wake. And obviously, wake is a very important part of our day. And if we don't have wakefulness, then it, you know it's hard to have sleep because we have these circadian rhythms, which are the body clock and hormones that are released to tell us when to go to sleep and when to get up in the morning. And and we're all a little bit different. Light and dark also play a lot into that. So wake is there and then the first stage is stage one sleep which is essentially drowsiness so that's when you're sitting there at the movie theater you're at home watching TV and you close your eyes and you kind of drift off and then you wake yourself up that's what's considered stage one sleep that's only about three to five percent of our total sleep time stage two sleep is what we spend most of our night in and that's about anywhere between 45 to 50 percent of the night which is where we get most of our rest then stage three and four sleep, which used to be separate, are now together, and that's what we call slow wave sleep. It's about 15 to 25 percent, and then there's dream sleep. The problem with the sleep-wake cycle is it's not that you go into stage one, two, three, and REM sleep, which is dream sleep. You go in and out of them all over, and there's a lot of things that can intrude there. The other thing is, is nobody really knows what they mean per se, meaning we know stage two, stage two sleep is where we spend most of our night. But is that what really what gives us our most refreshing sleep, or is it REM sleep, which is the dream sleep? And so there's some difficulties with that. What about delta sleep? What, what, what is that? Delta, that's that deep, deep, deep. That's the slow wave. <sighs> yeah, out of it, yep. gone. Now, uh, I know that as you get older, they've shown that, well, kids, babies sleep 22 hours a, a night, and that, that some people in their 80s or 90s sleep you know, very little. And I mean, it's just the natural progression as you get older. Now, the question I have is, but do they get Delta? I mean, does that adult 90-year-old or 80-year-old get enough Delta? And is that the Delta that makes, it, makes you rested? What is the Delta doing, anyway? I don't know that we know that for sure. Because, because once you hit the age of 30, that, that slow wave or Delta sleep actually starts to diminish. And once you get into your 60s, your sleep onset or sleep latency is actually prolonged, and so it's harder to go to sleep. And then you have much more arousals in the middle of the night after the age of 60. And actually, by the age of 90, they predict that most people will lose that slow wave sleep. And so is that really the thing that we need? And is there a medicine or a treatment or something we can do to get that back? And the answer is nobody knows right now. Yeah, I mean, if I had that delta sleep more, would that back stiffness <laughs> You know, yeah. not come on as I'm getting older, you know. I want to um, interrupt yeah. and go back to the gentleman that called. Um, if he's drowsy so much of the day, and you said it's it's complicated with the medicines that he needs to be on, yeah. can you improve wakefulness? Is that part of this conversation? Yeah, what, with a stimulant. What do you think uh, yeah, of uh, stimulant. stimulant? They're talking about uh, speed, you know, right. using that kind of medication for people who are drowsy during the day, and you know that they're getting enough sleep or they've done all the right thing. Why not? 
stimulate their, how about 14 cups of coffee? Yeah, that's what <laughs> they were the, thinking. The problem with this gentleman that, that sent us the message is that Parkinson's, number one, has an association with insomnia, it has an association with depression, it has an association with difficult sleep. Then the medicines you put on that, for that, the restless leg, also contribute. So there again, the sleep hygiene, do the sleep study to make sure sleep apnea is adequately treated, make sure nothing else is intruding into the sleep, and then you have to delve into the narcolepsy to see which is, what which is, is a diff, narcolepsy is a, a condition where REM sleep or the dream sleep, which causes us to kind of go into a paralysis and to go out cold, intrudes into sleep at inappropriate times during the day. And so you have to look in and say, is that an issue? Because that's a very chronic and debilitating condition that requires stimulant treatment for the most part, as well as some other cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah, things. we think. I mean, it's, you know, I, I just have a hard time with the stimulants. But, you know, I'm a Mr. Coffee drinker, so who am I to say? And we're going to take a break, but... Uh, yeah. uh, I was going to throw you a softball. Oh. No. Do you want to talk like 30 seconds about exercise? Does exercise make it easier for me to fall asleep. Yeah, well, I can go on and on about it, but I think that it really does, that's part of the reason why I think elderly don't sleep as well because they're not doing as much exercise, and I think you counter that problem with exercise now. Do you agree? I agree with that to the point that some would argue that exercise right before bed, even though it makes you feel tired, may not be the best right. plan not, to do it. You don't exercise right before bed, but if you can get a regular yep. walk-in every day. Yep, okay. I agree. Great. Well, we'll, we'll keep on trucking now. If a physician wants to determine whether or not a patient is dealing with a sleep disorder, a sleep study may be called for. So OnCall went to a sleep diagnostic la diagnostics lab for an extra port. We met with a registered polysomnography technologist, say that five times fast. That's a medical professional with special training in sleep medicine. Brain waves on a computer screen and the specialized ability to interpret what they mean. These are two of the most important aspects of a sleep study. Janie Isham understands this clearly. She's the point person for the Brookings Health System Sleep Diagnostics Lab, and she explains what patients can expect when here. They can expect to come and spend the night in a comfortable setting. Number one, we try to make it as comfortable and home-like as possible. They're going to have uh, multiple sensors on their scalp and on their face that record their brainwave activity. They'll have um, electrodes on their chest to monitor their heart rhythm, a sensor on their finger to watch their oxygen level. So we monitor a variety of, of things during the night. Patients at the sleep clinic see no injections or invasive procedures. They're simply hooked up to monitors with tape and adhesives. And one of the most important monitoring devices records what's going on in the brain during sleep. I'm looking at their brainwave activity, which actually tells me what stage of sleep they're in which is very important to know because we go through multiple stages throughout the course of a night's sleep. I would be monitoring their heart rhythm to make sure that that's normal. Their breathing, whether their airway is partially closing off or completely closing off, whether they're stopping breathing. I'd be monitoring their oxygen level to make sure that that's adequate. Isham says sleep apnea, which is an interruption in breathing while sleeping, is one of the sleep disorders she looks for, and it's a condition that can be serious. There's a lot of comorbidities and problems that we're finding that link sleep apnea that's untreated to diabetes, heart arrhythmias, stroke, high blood pressure, memory problems, just functioning, um, depression. All of those can be attributed to undiagnosed sleep apnea that's not been treated. Understanding the intricate connections sleep has with the body's overall health is rewarding to Aisham, and she feels gratified when able to help patients get a good night's sleep. It is very interesting, and we are monitoring so many different things, and it's very gratifying to have someone come in and be able to help them and, you know, just, I don't know how to say it improve their overall quality of life and be able to make a difference. And that's what I like about it. It is estimated that 40 million Americans are diagnosed with a chronic long-term sleep disorder each year and 20 million Americans have occasional sleep problems. 
Thank you for joining us tonight. We're talking about sleep disorders, and here live in our studio are Dr. Anthony Herricks and the on-call medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. They're ready to answer your questions, so you can call in right now. Our phone number is on the screen, and we've got a, a bunch of questions that just came in. First off, a caller from Sioux Falls, gentleman age 45, has chronic sleeping paralysis, um, went to a sleep clinic, didn't get much help. Any information would be helpful. Is it associated with narcolepsy? Right. What I, is it? This is great. I, I need to ask you this, but I, I, to explain, we have a shutoff mechanism in our spine or somewhere in the brain that says, you know, when you go into REM sleep and you're running after the lion or the lion's running after you or whatever your brain is doing, you could be very harmed by acting it out. So it para paralyzes you during REM sleep, and so you're there and you can't, you can't uh, move, and it keeps you from destroying your partner in the bed or you know, hurting yourself. So that's important that we have sleep paralysis. What this guy does is he comes out of his sleep enough to know he's sleeping, and he can't move, and it panics him. Yeah. And my comment is, no, know that you're in a dream state, take advantage of it, fly. You know, <laughs> jump off a mountain and fly, take advantage of it. You can do anything with your dreams. Okay, now, what's your comment to... about that? I don't know that much about sleep paralysis other than it can be associated with insomnia, it can be associated with sleep apnea, it can be associated with sleeping narcolepsy, pills. sleeping pills. Um, and usually uh, in the triad of daytime sleepiness, sleep paralysis, and hallucinations either before you go to sleep or wake up, called hypnagogic or hypnopompnic hallucinations. Oh, wow. well, that's a oh, yeah, so they're big words. words. Yeah. They are big words. Hypnopompnic. I yep. haven't heard that one. <laughs> that triad is in about 90% of patients with narcolepsy, but not everybody with sleep paralysis actually has narcolepsy. So there again, I think if you go to a sleep clinic, you should be evaluated for the realm of sleep disorders. Narcolepsy should be one of the things that should be attempted to be ruled out. And you may not find the answer. And I don't know if there's any treatment available for it off the top of my not, head. Not real okay. good treatment. Now, there's another treatment. I saw this at a conference, and I've never seen much about it. But there's the story of how a partner who has these wild dreams beats, you know, in his dreams, is beats the, the bad guy and it happens to be his wife, you know, or, and, is, and it traumatizes uh, his spouse or her spouse. What, what do you know about that and what, what kind of therapy do we have for it? That's, Same story? Yeah, that's called REM behavior disorder. And, and like he said, when you actually fall asleep and you get into dream sleep, there's that mechanism that causes a relative muscle weakness so we don't out, or interact with our dreams. Um, some of the people have actually jumping off balconies and they wondered if that's what happened in the middle of the night. They panicked, the, the beating of the spouse, the throwing chairs around. And what happens is that disconnect from our dreams is actually lost and then we actually start acting out those behaviors. Unfortunately, I think the treatment is benzodiazepines such as clonazepam or clonopin, which is a longer acting medicine, to try to help people with that. But um, so can, medication, medication. Kind of before we move forward. What do you know about the meaning of dreams? Oh. Don't know. Dreams are very, very interesting. I mean, Joseph in his many colored coat, I yeah. mean, he seemed to understand, deep, but you don't. I <laughs> honestly have no clue what dreams mean. And I think once we figure out why we dream and what they mean and how we can make some of those dreams good and get rid of some of those bad dreams, I think obviously dreaming is a wonderful thing if it's a good dream. So. I, and I will make this comment. I've read a number of articles that said that if you're aware that you're dreaming and you're dreaming, then you have control, take control, and you know make it a good thing. And I did that about a year ago. I had a bad, awful dream, and I mean, I'm coming out of this. Oh, this is horrible. Oh, I'm going to make this better. And suddenly, I magically made all of these problems. These people hmm. didn't die, and I was really a good guy, not a bad person. And there wasn't a storm that killed all these people. You know, all these right. things. You just change things we in your a dream. Question that fits right into what you're saying here. A, a female caller, age 86, she dreams so heavily. She dreams a lot during the night, um, and she dreams she's in distress. Uh, it's her sleep is also associated with apnea or a type of. A, Oh, aphasia, um, what can be done for this? Right. So she's having stress and distressing dreams and... Stress and... Uh, does, do, 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 do the dreams indicate that there's stress in her life? Yes. A lot of times when people come in, one of the things that's on our questionnaire is, do you have re uh, frequent dreams or vivid dreams? And a lot of times what happens, and one of the theories may be, is that when you remember a dream, you wake up 
around the time of the dream. Because we go through REM sleep about four or five different times during a total night of sleep. But how many of us remember having four any. or five dreams? Yeah. Or any for that matter. And so a lot of times when I have people come into the clinic and they say that they dream repetitively, that in my mind triggers that there's something intruding into their sleep whether it's periodic legs movements, which is the big toe twitching, or whether it's sleep apnea or, or anything like that. So they're waking up, they're, right. not, they're more shallow sleep. Right. Plus you put in uh, dementia, some of the medications to treat dementia, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, those all can contribute to dream manifestations, hallucinations, and things. And I do think that depression is a major problem with sleeplessness and or weird dreams, and maybe there are medicines that you can take for depression rather than Valium-like medicines for mm -hmm. sleep disorder to help you with your problem. So but depression it, medications like Prozac and that, yeah, do, of, it's it, a different process in the brain that those well, are... Well, and they're probably the best anti-anxiety drug because okay. they don't long-term make depression worse. So that's my The only word. argument I would have with that, if you look at one of the causes of insomnia, it's related to the SSRI drugs, which are the Prozacs and the Valium, mm -hmm. or excuse me, the Prozacs and the paroxetines or the Paxils. And yeah. so they can contribute to insomnia, they can contribute to periodic leg movement disorder, or restless right. legs. Restless legs syndrome. Right. And so, they can make restless right. legs syndrome worse. And so some of them actually make you tired as well. So you just try to find what the drug actually does for some people and you use it to that advantage. Sometimes you have to, it's a trial and error. There's no question about it. Although trazodone, which I think is, you know, one of the better drugs. I've said that earlier and you countered a little bit. So we may disagree on that one. but <laughs> It's in the same class as doxepin, if right. I'm not mistaken. And doxepin is actually the only FDA approved drug and we know as physicians that we use clinical experience a lot of times. And if doxepin and trazodone are similar, then why don't they work? And I think yep. it's just nobody's done the studies to say yep. this is it needs to be an FDA approved. The FDA approved, right. Okay. Um, a caller from Wakanda, 75-year-old gentleman. Is it all right to have sex or intercourse before trying to go to sleep? So if you're not supposed to be doing anything. Well, well what do you think about I that? I said there's only two things that should go on in the bedroom. One is marital <laughs> relations and the other is, is sleep. So that gets a thumbs up. That's well. <laughs> It goes along with the exercise, but I think that the stimulation associated with sexual intercourse and, and that behavior and the feelings around that is actually one of the more relaxing things that can actually be done before somebody goes to bed and uh, allow them to you know, get in that state of getting rid of the anxiety and the worry and put their mind on something else that's going to... I don't know. I mean, I'm afraid to say anything, but I would say this, <laughs> that... That's a relaxing thing. Nature did that. People fall asleep after having sex. Okay. And, but uh, I won't say anything more. Yeah, I'm going to change the topic real yeah. quick now. <laughs> uh, a female caller from Brandon, and the question is about narcolepsy cataplexia. Her granddaughter is 21 years old and diagnosed with this disorder. Uh, will she outgrow it? Will it lessen? Is there something that she can do for it? She, um, she's currently taking, the granddaughter's currently taking medication. So Tony, what, I, what is I don't it? know enough about that. I, I, you, you know. it's, it's a chronic disability that will be there most likely forever and it has to do with hormones in the brain that are, are dysregulated, neuropeptides, hormones, chemicals that we don't really have a good control on. There's ways that you can tr control it without medications, that's frequent naps. Um, there's ways that you can tr control it with medications which are the stimulants during the day. But it's, it's a very difficult thing, but with a multidisciplinary approach in general based on what textbook and literature would tell you is about 60 to 80 percent of it can be controlled. Uh, the cataplexy is the most concerning thing because you're at any... Cataplexy meaning? Cataplexy is uh, kind of that, that trigger from the brain that causes you to lose muscle tone when you're sleeping in REM sleep so you don't have those dream behaviors. It can be anything from just a weakness of the face that may not be noticed. It can be um, loss of bilateral extremity strength and you may fall. Um, the problem with that is, is you never know when it's going to come on, but a lot of times it's brought on by strong emotions like fear, anxiety, excitement, stress. And suddenly they fall. They right. can't stand up. And 90% of patients with cataplexy actually, excuse me, not 90, I think it's closer to about 70% of patients with cataplexy actually do have narcolepsy. So mm -hmm. you can't have cataplexy without narcolepsy. And narcolepsy, by definition, is REM sleep or dream sleep intruding into wakefulness inappropriately. Suddenly you're sleeping yep, and you just fall asleep at inappropriate times. That's a tough, uh, a tough one. So. Uh, well, I think you solve their sleep 
and their narcolepsy will get better, but not all. But the problem is, is most people with narcolepsy actually have normal sleep patterns. Their sleep-wake cycle, their amount of time that they get to bed at night, the, the quote-unquote seven to nine hours of good sleep is actually adequate, but that it intrudes during the day. And so there's anything from like cognitive behavioral therapy, frequent naps, those kind of things, treatment of the any insomnia that's associated with it, stimulants during the day, you know, you can get in a whole mess where you're giving stimulants during the day to keep people awake, and then you got to give them sleep aids at night to go to sleep, and it's a, mess. It's, it, it's a very difficult thing to take care of. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to make a comment that in uh, studying animals, uh, particularly a actually studying animal cycles, you know, hormonal cycles in rats, for example, they have found that if you put a rat in a black box, that the rat will extend the uh, length of time that they stay awake and then extend the time that they sleep at night so that their days are not 24-hour days, but they're 25 or 26-hour days. They've done this with humans. Uh, if you live in a pill box, they've done the studies, <laughs> and they say turn on the light when you're on, up and turn it off, the, they go pretty quickly to a, what, 26-hour, 25-hour. Yeah, yeah. really? So what relevance does that have, and why does that happen? Well, it goes along with the circadian rhythms that I previously mentioned, and that means that the body chemicals say, okay, now it's time for sleep. We know that if you sit in very bright, and this, happen, this is why if you go into an industrial setting where you have people who are working at night, they don't have the lights dim, they have them very bright. And the reason for that is, is that light actually stimulates wakefulness. And so you can actually take somebody in a, in a setting and actually shut the windows down so they don't know whether it's day or night, and you can actually turn their body clock completely around so they don't know which is day or which is night based on just changing light patterns. Light patterns, but it takes a while. And, that's what, while. and there's a lot said about industrial people letting people move into their shift work slowly and let them do 26-hour cycles until they get down to the nighttime cycle and stay that for a couple of weeks and then do the, the thing again. I just came back from China. I had a yeah, huge a flip-flop. All I can tell you is I did a lot of reading. <laughs> and I, you know, we, we, we didn't use a lot of medication and we, we, we did the conservative things. Back to that, that industrial environment, that shift work related to sleep disorder is something that's very prevalent too. Yeah. Meaning that once you get into that environment, what we see is, for example, our ICU nurses. They'll work three nights, they'll have a couple days off, and then they'll work three days. And that's actually more horrible than having somebody that works all night shift. The problem you do with the, with the night shift worker is they've done that for 20 years, and then they come to see you, and now they're retired, and they can't sleep at night. They've got to sleep during the day. And so to try to, to make those changes is very important, but you have to do it very slow. There's actually a window that if you try to make yeah. those changes too abruptly, that it throws it completely out of cycle and can actually make things worse than But better. light therapy is a very important thing. Very and therapy. the other thing that you said is so important, I love this, is, and I think it's really true, get up at the same time every day. Weekends too, yep. or at least close to it. Uh, if you're, you know, you just don't sleep late, late on weekends and Not then... like being a teenager. Right? Can't do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we've got a question from Jefferson. Do the doctors recommend melatonin? Uh, they take three milligrams, one capsule daily at bedtime. And should she keep doing it? Some of that circadian rhythm actually has to do with the hormone of melatonin and how it's released at times when we should be going to sleep. So what they've tried to do is take melatonin out of the body and, and, and give it to you in a pill form to see if it'll help. And that's, what's the name of that pill? Uh, well, there's Rosarum, which is a mel melatonin like. drug that's been made to work at the receptor. Mm -hmm. If you go to the local herb store or whatever and you buy melatonin, the problem with that is is those drugs that aren't FDA approved don't have a set standard of what the dose of actual true melatonin is. And that's from pill to pill and bottle to bottle, so you never know what you're getting. Yeah. Okay. Melatonin, otherwise, whether you get it from the local GNC store or wherever you get it from, is actually a good choice to start with if you, if you want to use it. However, there have been some associations with higher doses with bleeding risk and things like that. So well, you, know, and you worry about melatonin. Where does it come from? Did it come from a cow brain? Mm -hmm. And if it's a cow brain, well, you worry about slow viruses. So mm -hmm. I've, I'm reluctant. Do you know where they get No, this? I have no clue where they get the melatonin. Okay. But mm -hmm. All right, uh, Plant-sourced melatonin I would be a little bit more comfortable with. All right. 
Um, changing gears, a question from Mitchell, and you're going to be able to talk about uh, CPAP machines and sleep apnea. Female caller, she has sleep apnea, wears a mask that when she's wearing it, there's noise that wakes her. She's tried several masks. What can she do other than wearing a mask to get some sleep? Um, she feels the mask is doing her more harm than good. There's a lot about the getting properly fit for masks on, sleep, on CPAP machine. What, now, what, quick, what is a CPAP machine? It's a continuous positive airway pressure and it, is, it just it fits over your nose or it fits over your face and it gives you an increased pressure, therefore it opens up the airway and those people who have obstruction from airway as a cause of sleep uh, hypoxia or low oxygen at night, it'll open that up. But the problem is having a device that actually works and yeah. you can use comments. But If I could figure out a way to make masks fit and pressure tolerable, CPAP would be easy to use. It's no different. I'm just going to be a simple country boy from Gettysburg. It's an air compressor that sits at the side of the bed that goes through this tight-fitting mask on your face. And the biggest complaints I get from people is the mask is uncomfortable. And depending on how bad the sleep apnea, that pressure that you have to give to keep the airway open actually blows the mask off the face. And if you can imagine laying there in bed and turning sideways and the mask getting pushed and then it leaks and makes go. this horrible noise. I jokingly had a guy tell me today, he has what's called, what I call the hockey mask. It goes all the way around the face. He, he told me it sounded like the, the biggest elephant he's ever heard pass gas. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you could imagine that waking you up in the middle of the night, how? Uh, it sounds like it would be very difficult so, for But me. it's better now. I mean, the, the masks and the nose masks and all of those devices are way better than they used to be. And, you, and if you just get, get, stay in there and keep trying, don't give up easy. I know that some people give up too early on Right. That. Most people that come to, the, to us just for sleep, you give them the mask and the machine, they go home. They may not like it, but if they feel better, they'll use it. Okay. There's a few people that don't find it important, and so those are the people that will sell you after a couple of weeks. I'm just not going to use it. There's a few people in the middle that struggle, and so I tell them to try and find the right mask. Keep going back and make that home, me home medical equipment company work for you so you can get the mask that fits you, because if you can ultimately find an interface or a mask that will work, it will be so much easier. Sometimes under treating people for a while, so they get used to the mask, they, they find out what fits lower for them. Lower pressure. Lower pressure so they don't have that leak in the middle of the night. And then crank it up a little and bit And then just better. go up a little bit. Okay. Auto CPAP machines are the new rave. With, yeah. Instead of having one pressure that goes all night long, you set a low pressure, a high pressure. It actually titrates up and titrates down depending on your needs oh, wow. throughout the night. And it sometimes allows people who, when they get into dream sleep, have horrible sleep apnea. For that period of time, they actually get treated aggressively and at other times during the night maybe they don't need as much pressure and they're more tolerable. To it's them. really moving. Mean, I had a guy, he couldn't take it for about four months. His wife was persistent. You will, you will. And be eventually he did. And by th he's the sold guy. It makes so much difference. Whenever I go anywhere, I've got to use it because it just makes my sleep so much better in the day that follows so much better. So sleep apnea is serious business. What are, the complications are big Heart time. failure, death, mm -hmm. early death, stroke. You know, heart you're attack. Not getting oxygen, right? It yeah, your low you. oxygen levels cause early atherosclerosis. There's, there's not a lot of good evidence that says this is a chicken and egg phenomenon, though. Meaning, if you have sleep apnea, are you going to have a heart attack? If you have sleep apnea, are you going to have a stroke? But we do know there's an association, definitely with uncontrolled high blood pressure, definitely with diabetes. The thing, the, there's several speculations. One is the low oxygen levels, but not everybody who has obstructive sleep apnea actually has low oxygen levels. There are some people that get away with normal oxygen levels, and they probably have healthier lungs than some of that, that don't. The other issue is every time the brain gets awoken from a deep sleep to a less deep sleep, it, the catecholamines, the hormones, are upregulated in the body. The heart rate goes up and the blood pressure goes up. As Dr. Holm probably knows, a lot of people present with heart attacks in the middle of the night and they present with strokes in the middle of the night. And my thought behind that is, is what happens is you have that predisposed behavior of peripheral vascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes. You have sleep apnea that's untreated. The hormones go up. The blood pressure goes up. Grandma has a stroke, wakes up in the morning, and can't move. Okay. I well, agree with you. We'll give you 15 seconds. Take to home message, 15 seconds. On. Good sleep hygiene, have problems with sleep. You know, I would probably come see your primary care physician, your pulmonologist, whoever it is, because sleep is very important. We know that people who sleep for less than six hours a night have, have a greater chance of dying, and people who sleep greater than 10 hours 
have a greater chance of dying early. So and don't sleep is use great. It. Don't depend on the pills. The pills mm -hmm. should be the very last things to try. They're okay. a band -aid. Well, thanks so much, doctors. We will be right back. We're going to go to the homespun perspective, and then what's new in medical science. Looking for reliable healthcare information online? You can start with the resources link at the OnCall website. From there, you can access a variety of accurate and dependable information sources, including the South Dakota State Department of Health and Medline Plus. I must admit, I am not one for getting enough sleep. Like many others, I have an internal drive and clock, which I presume comes from the combination of disparate genetic threads of many and varied ancient ancestors. Somewhere from back in the recesses of my heredity appears the desire to stay up late, revel, and dance around a campfire. Yet within this same combination of chromosomes appears also a separate and compelling force to get up early and get work done. The result of the coming together of just such ancestral drives is a guy who cuts short his daily requirement of sleep. I'm always pushing it, and short naps are my only saving grace. Having watched the scientific literature through, uh, through the years about sleep, I have noted that the data has been relatively inconclusive about the value of getting more sleep. Of course, grandmothers have always scolded those who wanted to stay up late, and Ben Franklin agreed, early to bed and early to rise makes you healthy, wealthy, and wise. But where's the proof? that people would benefit from getting more sleep. A recent small study seems to clarify that question. It followed 11 male basketball players and monitored their sleep, finding the actual sleep obtained in this group was between six to nine hours. The researchers then required players to get at least 10 hours of sleep per night, including naps, for about seven weeks. Measurement of player abilities before and after the sleep intervention found that with the increased sleep, the players ran faster sprints by 5%, free throw percentages increased by 9%, three-point field goal percentages increased by 9.2%, and the players reported feeling and doing better during games. Of course, there's also scientific data to say that individual needs vary. And as a person ages, sleep needs lessen. We also know that too much sleep can be a diagnostic tool for depression. And we don't exactly know what the ideal hours of sleep would be for what age and what individual. That said, perhaps it is time to heed what grandmothers have told us for years. We would do better if we got more sleep. We'll be right back. In our medical news tonight, one of the challenges in using chemotherapy to attack cancer is the fact that cancer cells are a lot like normal cells. It's difficult to identify compounds and chemicals that will tackle cancer cells and leave the normal cells alone. Chemotherapy drug, drugs that go after rapidly dividing and growing cancer cells also kill other rapidly dividing and growing cells like blood cells and the cells that make our hair grow. Researchers at Stanford University in California have just announced results from a study that appear to have made some headway in the chemotherapy battle against cancer. Stanford scientists have found a chemical compound that prevents cancer cells from taking up glucose. Glucose is a sugar and it's the energy source for some cancers. The study focused on a common form of kidney cancer that is resistant to standard chemotherapies. These cancer cells have a specific genetic mutation that causes uncontrolled cell growth, cells that are feeding off of glucose. The new chemical compound targets a biochemical process that healthy cells don't usually have and the compound is able to disrupt the cancer cell's ability to utilize glucose. The scientist who is the senior study author involved in this research says it is, quote, a pretty powerful way of killing those cells. It's a treatment that's still in the laboratory and not yet ready for the clinic, but it highlights some of the complicated factors involved with using chemicals to selectively attack cancer cells. 
And that's about all of our time for this evening. On Call will take a break next week, and we'll be back on August 18th with a show about arthritis. But in the meantime, please remember that On Call is rebroadcast on SDPB Digital Channel 2, Mondays at 11 a.m. Central and Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Central. Once more, I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Anthony Herricks, and of course, the On Call Medical Editor, Dr. Rick Holm. Thanks to our phone volunteers, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. Funding for this program is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. To learn more about life and health, you can order your copy of The Picture of Health, a beautiful book containing insightful essays and evocative images by on-call medical editor Dr. Rick Holm and Dr. Judith Peterson. This book, containing health care advice, stories of medical history, and meditations on healing, can now be yours for $17 at the South Dakota Ag Heritage Museum. Call 1-877-227-0015. One five to order. This offer is made by Ag Bio Communications at South Dakota State University.